Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'd like to start this. Um, first of all, I have a home group. It's a vision for you in Union, New Jersey, and some home group members are here for support, and I thank you. And I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. And, uh, and I've had an experience with the 12 steps and uh, more than one time. And so I'd like to just kind of quiet the mind, just do like uh, just a short, maybe one minute, two minute quiet, um, starting with a set aside prayer, which is really important to me in step two, because it's uh, it's about laying aside our prejudices in step two. So God, please help me set aside everything I think I know for an open mind and a new experience. Help me see my need to come to believe in a power greater than myself. So we're, we're at step two, and um, last week, for those of you who are here, Chris did a really uh, wonderful job on step one. And for me, step two is like a giant washout of the first step. And I've got to come from a place where uh, of unacceptability. If I find myself coming out of step one and things are acceptable, I probably really haven't seen my truth in step one. Step one for me is a place of complete unacceptability. It's just purely bottom. I mean, step one is bottom. Step one is, uh, you know, that I'm from a point of absolute hopelessness, powerlessness, and unmanageability. And I've got to come into step two from that point. I'm never going to really have a reason to believe in a power greater than myself because I'm holding the power. And if I'm, if I'm not hopeless and I'm not powerless and I've got to really grasp this hopeless powerless, I've got to see it, you know, this first part and guys that go through the work with me and people that have been in my workshops at the office, I spend weeks and weeks on step one and it's just how I was brought through that I've got to have an absolute step one experience or I'm not going to go forward with the rest of this work. You know, I lose more sponsees in step four and step nine, not because they're lazy, because they don't really believe they've got a problem. They never really see their truth in step one. And they, you know, for me, step one means I'm going to drink. Or whatever your first step experience is, if it's drugs, if it's gambling, if it's sex, whatever it is, for the purpose of this workshop here in this meeting, I'm going to talk about my experience with alcohol. I drink. And without a power greater than myself and a spiritual awakening, I'm, I'm a dead man walking. I'm a drunk. And that's what I do. I drink. And, you know, I've got to see that in the powerlessness that I've got this physical allergy that when I put alcohol in my body, I lose control of how much I'm going to take and when I'm going to stop using it. And then when I'm stopped, I've got to absolutely grasp the fact that I can't control the stop. I can stop for today, I can stop for tomorrow, but sooner or later, it's not in my control when I'm going to start drinking again. And if I don't see that, I've got to go back into it again and, and look at my history. Is it abundantly confirmed that I am completely powerless over alcohol? And... It's so important for me to have that foundation of the first step, and not just for the second step, for all the steps. Whenever I have a problem in any step, for me, it's a first step problem. Just, I'm getting comfortable with life, and, you know, I get to a point, and to this, and I'll jump for a second, into the second half of the first step, you know, this unmanageability. You know, all of a sudden, things are okay in my life. And you know what? The unmanageability kind of spearheads in front of everything else, and things are manageable. And everything else gets set to the side. And the fact that I'm powerless over alcohol becomes secondary to external manageabilities. Got a job, got the wife, got the family, got a girlfriend. Things are all good. Got a boyfriend, whatever, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden... 
you know, my life's not that bad. And maybe these crazy uh, decisions, you know, I once sat down and said, you know, I'll go to any length. Well, maybe I don't have to go to any length anymore because things start getting better in my life. And, you know, that's a scary place to be. You know, and I got to, so I, I get to realize that, and, and it's not just in the external unmanageabilities for the purpose of this point, and I'm going to talk about the internal manageabilities, the spiritual malady. You know, I got to see, can I fix my emotions? You know, and where am I at in personal relationships? Not, not whether I have one or I don't have one. But how are they going for me? You know, am I full of fear, misery, depression? I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm talking about the anxiety and depression from untreated alcoholism. The stuff that's sitting right there in the first step and that, you know, as soon as it gets a little bit better and I just kind of drift away and drift away. So I've, I, I have to come from a point of hopelessness, powerless, unmanageability, and then I come to the second step and they talk about sanity, you know, that this power greater than myself is going to restore me to sanity. And I've got to see insanity also in step one. If I don't see insanity in step one, why am I going to want to be restored to sanity? And, and you know, early on when I first came into the rooms, I thought of insanity as the stuff I did drunk in blackout, stuff people told me. Um, and then through guidance of a sponsor that was educated in our big book and through workshops and meetings of I really understood the word sanity you know that you know doing the same thing over and over again knowing it's going to hurt me and not changing how I'm going to deal with it and I didn't have the power to change it it was really the the problem it was lack of power and we're going to get into this so you know, and there's this part of this book in More About Alcoholism that talks about the jaywalker. And, you know, I think of, my, you know, what if I lived across the street from the jaywalker and watched this guy run out in front of a bus every day or a train or something and get whacked and watch the ambulance peel this guy away and a week later he comes back out and I'm having coffee in the morning and I see him run back out in front of a bus again. That, that's insanity. The guy thinks he's going to get to the other side and not get hit. And his experience abundantly confirms that every time he jumps in front of a bus, he's getting mowed over. And he still goes for it. And that's how I dealt with alcohol. No matter what I saw, no matter what my truth was, I was strangely insane and I was blocked from really seeing that when I pick up a drink again, I can't control how much I'm going to drink. And I can't control the stop. So I've got this mental and physical problem, and I'm dying. I'm absolutely dying, and I'll do anything. At that point, when I came in here, I would have done anything. I saw people laughing. I wasn't laughing. I saw people having fun. I wasn't having fun. I just didn't understand what was really going on. I thought I had a problem with drinking, and that's, I just wanted to stop drinking. So I came from a place of hopelessness. And, you know, in, in the Nine Step Promises, it talks about, you know, no matter how far down the scale you've come, you know, your experience will help, can help other people. It doesn't matter if you came in these rooms 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week, absolute drunk like Chris talked about last week getting the deal done you know he got the job done or if you were just a weekend binge drinker binge drinker and you couldn't stop you know if you have the problem if you have the physical allergy and the mental obsession you're in a point of hopelessness it just doesn't matter so I've got to come now to understand and, and I'm going to give you two two different experiences as I go through this first step the second step the first time I went through it, I didn't understand, I didn't even know I had a second step experience until, and then the last few times going through the 12 steps, I really had a whole different experience in the second step. 
But the first time around, all I knew is that on a Friday night, I couldn't stop drinking. And on Monday, I wasn't drinking anymore. And something came between me and that booze over those couple days, and I wasn't drinking, and it wasn't me. And, you know, what I learned, I was in the grace of God at that time, and I was, you know, pulled from the gutters. And I say to myself sometimes, why me? You know, why was it me that was pulled from this? And, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm just grateful. And I'm grateful to, with my relationship through, to God, with God through this work. So, so we get to this chapter, we agnostics, and we go through this book, and it's a textbook. And you know, this book's meant to be, it's not a novel, it's meant to be studied, it's meant to be taught. And at the end of each chapter is usually some conclusion of something that we learned, and then we come in and it begins in the chapter ahead. So we're coming into we agnostics, which is step two, and I'm going to do kind of a little bit of a workshop style. And you know, if you have books, you can carry on and read a little bit. But at the end of More About Alcoholism, on page 43, it says, Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. So it's telling me I've gone through the first 43 pages of this book. I've been taught it. I've sat down with the sponsor that's had an experience with this book. And I've got to come to a place that my defense must come, and, it, and it's just, except, except in a few rare cases. And I thought that for a little while, figuring that, you know, here was the insanity that, that, well, I don't need to worry. It's just a few cases that need that higher power. So maybe I really don't need it when I was first coming around. That maybe I can get by and get the job done on my own. You know, even though I've abundantly confirmed that, you know, life run on my will is never positive. So... What I learned going through with someone that was educated in this book was the strange mental blank spot, suddenly. And uh, suddenly scares me. And without a higher power, you know, suddenly doesn't tell me, you know, suddenly's coming in three seconds, call your sponsor, you're going to drink. You know, suddenly doesn't say, you know, stop. You know, don't, you know, remember your last drunk, you know. Suddenly is suddenly, and suddenly anybody that's had a strange mental blind spot, and I've got a couple of sponsees in this room that can confirm, when suddenly happens, they're drunk. And then they say, how did it happen? Why did it happen? And why it happens is because there was a lack of conscious contact with a higher power. I wasn't, you know, not living in the tenth step. There was some point of breakdown and they weren't safe and protected and placed in a position of neutrality. And it'll say in the 10th step that we were restored to sanity. And at the end of the chapter of We Agnostics, it's going to state that he was restored to his right mind. And that's what we're going to talk about in this step two, is we're going to break it down into two parts, uh, came to believe in the power greater than ourselves, and we're going to talk about God and it may disturb some people. I'm only going to share my own experience. God's my higher power. And to me, there's going to be a decision that I made, and, that, and we'll get to that, where either God's everything or he's nothing, and what's my choice to be? And if I have power, I don't need God. If I don't have power, I need a higher power. So the choice was pretty simple. When I got went through this work, the way my sponsor worked me is he painted me right into a corner. He pushed me back and I had nowhere else to go but admit I was completely powerless. So I needed power. So we come to the beginning of We Agnostics and it'll say in the preceding chapters we learned something of alcoholism. We hope that made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic can control or moderate. The alcoholic can't. When you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. Or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. So if you can't quit entirely, it means you have a mental obsession. And if you can't control the amount you take, it means you have a physical allergy that Dr. Silkworth talks about in the doctor's opinion, this phenomenon of craving. If that's the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only uh, 
a spiritual experience will conquer. And if and then it'll talk a little bit about an atheist and an agnostic. And I didn't understand the difference. And now I understand that, you know, an atheist denies that God exists and an agnostic doesn't think it'll work for the, for the agnostic. And I, I, was, I thought I was atheist and I came to believe I was agnostic because I, I didn't understand God. So it was easy just to say it didn't exist, even though I couldn't argue or I just didn't understand it, so I took the, the easy way out and just said I was an atheist. So, a little bit further down that paragraph, it talks about to to be doomed an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not easy uh, are not always easy alternatives to take. So it's telling me that I'm either going to have to live on a spiritual basis or I'm going to die an alcoholic death. And I used to think it was dying, you know, like in the ground dying. But I learned with about 18 months of abstinence from alcohol what it means to die an alcoholic death and still be walking, to hit a sober bottom, to be living in the death of the spiritual malady. And, you know, I, so at that point, 18 months prior to that, I failed at killing myself. And then 18 months later, without a drink or any solution to my problems in my body, I, I realized that what it was like to be dying, un, dying from untreated alcoholism was horrible, horrible way. So a little, then I'm going to jump. I'm going to just bullet through some of this stuff and go through and share my experiences as we go along. So on, on 44, it talks about the only must in the chapter. And it says, but after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Or else what? Or else we're going to live in untreated alcoholism or we're going to relapse and die. And for me to drink is to die. So we go over to page 45, and here's a, a huge point of hope in this book. And, it's, you know, a promise. It says what my problem is. You know, my problem is lack of power. So the problem is within. I learned through this work and through page 52 in the Bedevilment that my problem's within, and the good news is the solution's within also. And we're going to see that where to find the great reality deep inside. So it says lack of power is my dilemma. And I always change we to me because I, I go through this book on a personal basis, that I had to find a power by which to live. So it's not talking about drinking anymore. It's telling me I need to find a power on how to live. And it had to be a power greater than myself. Obviously, it hit, but where do, do I find this power? Well, that's exactly what the book's about. Its main objects enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. So what's my problem? Lack of power, not drinking. So for the first time, I'm realizing that I don't have a drinking problem. I have a problem of that spiritual malady within. And, and when we get later into this book and when someone comes to present in the fourth step, we're going to learn that the liquor was but our symptom. It wasn't the problem. And that the problem centers in the mind, not the body. So I've got to fix the mind or else I'm never going to stop drinking. So I learn I've got an internal condition, lack of power. And I've got to go to myself at this point. When I was going through, the, you know, and I used to hear people say all the time, oh, they did stuff because they're alcoholic. You know, uh, I lied, I cheated, I stole, I did all this other stuff, you know, and they blame it on their alcoholism. No, that's a spiritual malady. There's, I learned through going through this work and sponsoring people that were alcoholic and weren't alcoholic. Lots of people have the spiritual malady. Not everybody has alcoholism or drug addiction. You've got to go back to your own truth, go through this stuff and find out you're alcoholic and I'll keep banging this through if you're powerless over alcohol. It doesn't have anything to do with the rest. The rest is just the salute, the problem and we're going to find the solution. And if we fix the spiritual malady, we're going to fix the problem and then we're not going to drink to, because the liquor is my solution. When I need liquor, you know, I come to a point and say, you know, you, that, well, I, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in a second. 
But so let, let's go down to the bottom of page 45, and they talk about this book talks about how I how I feel. It says I know how I feel. We if you know we've shared honest doubt and prejudice. Some of us have been violently anti-religious to others. The word God brought up a particular idea. And so it's going to talk about God. And, and the doubt and prejudice is what stands between me and God. The doubts and prejudice, my new ideas are my old ideas. And we say the set-aside prayer, and we're going to talk about the prejudices and laying it aside and casting it aside as we go there. And, you know, if I'm so smart, you know, I find myself when I went through this work, and my sponsor would always say to me, Ian, you're, you're too smart for for this program. You know, you're just too smart. And then he would say to me, like, you know, how's it working for you? You know, you know how are things going? You know, how you manage in your life? You know, how, how are things with your wife and kids? You know? And uh, see, he knew the answers because I'd pick up the phone and I'd call him every day. Oh, my partner, I can't stand him. He calls me, wants to know where I'm at. You know, my wife's throwing me out of the house. The kids don't want to talk to me. I, I, my friend, all this, I'm always in drama. Why? Because I'm managing my own life. and It's not working too well. You know, and, it, and that's where it got me. It got me to a place of unmanageability. So we flip over to 46, and we got jump into the second paragraph down. There's a, it says, we found as soon as we're able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commence to get results. So all I need to do is just be willing, and I'm going to start getting results. Even though it was impossible for any of us to define or comprehend that power, which is God, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach to start and to effect contact with him. So as soon as I admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe, an underlying totality, things... You know, things that identify, you know, whatever your conception of God, we begin to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took some other simple steps. We went through the rest of the work. We found that God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him. So my job, I'm going to learn in this chapter, I, going back through, if it's my first time, and I say this, for people that go through the work the first time, go through it, my experience, go through it as fast as you can, and come back and do it again. And you'll have a whole different experience. But go through the work. Don't get bogged down early on. Find a sponsor that will take you through the work. You know, Because then I'm going to see, when I come back, first time through going through the work, I couldn't see my job was to seek God. But now I see that's my job in this work, is to continually seek Him. To us, the realm of the Spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. So, Am I earnestly seeking them? And so that we come through and we get to a point that brings us to the first part of step two. On page 47, it says we needed to, and there's good stuff in here, and there's not enough time to go through all this. Um, we needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? As soon as a man could say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically ensure that that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among that upon, amongst among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderful and effective spiritual structure can be built. So that's the first part of step two. So it's talking that it, all I need to do is believe or just be willing to believe that there's a power. In, and how am I going to be willing to believe? I've got to come from a place of complete despair. I've got to come from hopelessness. I've got to, there's got to be a door that I stand in front of that says hope, sanity, power, because I'm coming out of another door that's hopelessness, powerlessness, insanity, unmanageability. If I walk out of that door why, and I'm not feeling that way, I don't need to go into the next door where there's hope and there's power and there's sanity. I'm just never going to do it, and I'm going to balk, and I'm never going to go forward. So, and it talks about this simple cornerstone. And, and when you go, you know, when you go through the work, you're going to learn the building blocks. And you're going to need that when you get to the fifth step because it's going to talk about your, if your stones are properly in place. And we come back to this when we review it. And before that, on page 12, we're going to see that the foundation of willingness, 
with Bill's talking and Bill's story about the foundation of willingness. On page 17, we're going to talk about the cement that's going to bind us, the half common problem and half common solution. So we take all this stuff, and now we're at step two, and we got a cornerstone. And, you know, and anybody that stands here, he knows construction. The cornerstone's what you build. You lay it right on the footings, and you start building on the cornerstone. It's, it's what's going to hold everything together. And when you're doing this work and you're going to get to the third step, you're going to build this arch and you're going to lock it in with the keystone up top. So we get to this point of just willing to believe. I've got to just be willing to believe. And that's the great news. For we had assured we could not make spiritual principles unless we accepted many things, faith which seemed difficult to believe. And for me, faith is a result of results. You know, I, I hit my back playing golf, and I can't walk, and I'm in pain, and my buddy says he's got a chiropractor that can fix me, and I saw him one day take a swing, and he dropped like a sack of potatoes, and he's running around the golf course. I have faith that that chiropractor fixed his back. So I have faith, and I go to see this guy, and I have faith in it, you know? And I always say, like, I, I'm going to read a story, and came from a friend of mine, Tyler, in California. And it's about how do I come to believe, you know, in this faith? And you take this story and carry it on, because it's really good. You know, the way she says it will probably be much more elegant and elaborate than the way I say it. But, you know, imagine yourselves however many years ago, before you picked up your first drink, before you ever used, and you're sitting down, and someone comes up to you with a bottle of vodka or whatever your first step problem is, puts it on the table and says, Ian, this bottle is going to do for you what you could never do for yourself. It's going to make you feel self-confident, take fear away, take loneliness away. It's going to make everything in your life feel good. Sounds good. It's going to be a dominant factor in your life for me for the next 30 years. And then it's going to turn on you, and it's going to take everything that you value in life away. You're going to lose your family, your job, your house. You're going to go to court. You're going to go to jail. You're stealing. You're prostituting. You know, it's going to kill you. And then I see people sipping that vodka and having fun, right? And I make a decision. It won't happen to me. I'm different. I can control it. I can make it. I can fix it. And relationship or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, so how did I come to believe in the, in the alcohol? I came to believe in the alcohol when I took the sip. And all of a sudden, I wasn't that afraid anymore. And I really felt pretty good and I could talk to people. I could do what I'm doing now. I could stand at this podium and talk instead of being shriveled up in a corner afraid. So, you know, faith is a result of results. I had faith in the alcohol at the time because every time I picked it up, I felt good until it turned and cut me to ribbons. So I come to this point of, you know, how am I going to believe? Well, how I believe is I see you guys. I see my sponsor. I see people that I know were just like me. When Ebby came to Bill, and, and Bill sat down drinking while Ebby was there, 12-stepping him in Bill's story, Bill knew Ebby was a violent drunk just like him. Bill knew that Ebby was out of control, and Bill saw something different. He said he, Ebby was on fire. You know, He knew that he was going to let him do his ranting and raving because he didn't want to give him up the alcohol, but he planted the seed. Bill had some faith that something had been different. And that's how I started to get faith. I saw that people I knew that were drinking the way I used to drink weren't drinking anymore. So you go to page 48, and, and we're going to start talking about hope now. You know, And it's going to say, faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we tried to be on other questions. In this respect, alcohol was the great persuader. It finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. Sometimes it was a tedious process. If they go back in your life and think about the tedious processes, drunk or sober, 
You know, how many times did you do stuff in, in, I mean, I shouldn't say, I can tell you, and I'm not going to right now because I don't have enough time, of all the stuff I did in recovery without having a higher power in my life. You know, just abstinent from alcohol. And I had a tedious process. And the alcoholic destruction didn't stop when I stopped drinking. And a little bit further down in this, on page 48, it says, Sim- simply because it's impossible to explain what we see, feel, direct, and use without reasonable assumption as a starting point. Well, my reasonable assumption is the willingness to believe. And my sponsor would pound that in me. Just be willing to believe. Just be willing to believe, Ian. And, you, and you'll start seeing some truths in your life. And we get to page 49, and the last paragraph on 49 says, We who traveled this dubious path, and above it it says, Instead of regarding ourselves as intelligent agents, spearheads to God's ever advance in creation, we agnostics are atheists because they still believe. Again, this coming to believe is... It did, we didn't just believe, we came to believe, we come to believe. It's, it happens over time. That um, Choose to believe that our human intelligence was the last word, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, rather vain of us, wasn't it? So the spearhead for me is we're all spearheads too. We're, your sponsor spearheads you to a, a spiritual awakening, a relationship with God, to like a pointer and a point in the direction that I'm going to take you to this place that you haven't been anymore. I'm going to take you from complete hopelessness to hope. I'm going to take you from insanity to sanity. And I've got to believe that you can do it. Because if I really go back again and again, and I'll say it to my first step experience, I have no other choice. It's the last stop. It says, we've traveled that path. Beg you to lay aside prejudice. Okay. And when and this is where the set aside prayer comes in. We're asking you to lay aside prejudice. We're not telling you to get rid of everything you know. Just put it to the side for a little bit to be open to a new experience, to see if something else can work in your life. Because again, for me, how is it working for you? It wasn't working too good. So get to page fifty and we're gonna start talking about how the changes start happening. On one proposition, however, these men and women are strikingly agreed. Every one of them has gained access to and believes in a power greater than themselves. And we're talking about these first hundred people that wrote this book. And this were my faith. I've got to believe if it happened to them, why can't it happen to me at this point? This power in each case accomplished the miraculous and humanly impossible. You know, here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. So that... Uh, flatly declare since they've come to believe in a power greater than themselves to take a certain attitude. And what's the attitude they're taking? They're just laying down the prejudice. They're setting it aside so that they can be open-minded and just willing to believe in something that they never believed in. I grew up Jewish. I didn't grow up Catholic, but I grew up in an area where the majority of my friends growing up were Catholic. I probably went to church as much as I went to temple as as a young kid. And I, and I used to see one of my friends get whipped. He'd come home with bruises all over his hands from a nun with a yardstick. And, and I had, you know, it was strange. I had a weird conception of God through what I saw through these people. You know, and so I had a lot to lay aside too. I never really grew up in a, in a, in a family that really pronounced God. But, so they're talking about this certain attitude towards a power and to do a certain simple things. These, you know, to do the steps, there would have been a revolutionary change in the way of their living and thinking. It's not talking about their drinking. In this chapter, we're, we're going to lay aside the drink problem and start talking about the thinking and living problem. In face of their collapse and despair through my own willpower, in the face of total failure of their human resources, so it's saying that they failed in everything they tried to do, to stop this, they found a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. This happened as soon after they wholeheartedly met a few requirements. And to me, what's wholeheartedly mean? It's a commitment. You know, wholeheartedly is a commitment to commit to do it. It's, it's from the heart, wholeheartedly. It's not just I'm going to say it to get you off my back. It's, you know, the wholeheartedly came into me when I decided I was doing this work for me. 
Not for anybody else. Not for a family member. Not for a job. For nobody. I was doing this work for Ian because I was scared I was going to die. My first step experience just scared me to death. And I realized that I needed to do this work to live. And I wanted to do it. And I really, for the first time at that point, I wanted to do it. I had wholeheartedly committed to do the simple requirements. You know, to smash all ideas that all human aid wasn't going to help me. To do whatever my sponsor told me that was within the guidelines of this book to have a spiritual awakening. It says that once confused and baffled by the seemingly futility of existence, they showed they showed the underlying reasons why they were making a heavy going of life. Who here can identify with a heavy going of life? You know, you walk, you wake up, and you're full of fear, you're full of anxiety, you're scared to pick up the phone, whatever, you know, every, you just feel like bogged down. And, you know, later on in this book, you're going to have that lifted. And, and earlier in, in There's a Solution, it talks about being rocketed into the fourth dimension to be levitated. You're not living in this, whole, in this heavy going of life. And then it says the most profound thing it could say right here, leaving aside the drink question. So this heavy going of life isn't about the drinking. It's about what's going on within me. It's, you know, we learned just before that lack of power is my dilemma and the solution's power. So the hope is that it's within me. It's not about the drink anymore. It's about me. They tell why living was so unsatisfactory and they show how the change came over them. So when you go out on a speaking commitment and you talk about your story, you want to tell what it was like, the heavy going of life, and, and then what happened and what it's like now, the change that came over you, your relationship with your higher power, how you came to believe, and not just believe, but how you got a conscious contact with God or whatever your higher power may be. And so it then says, when many hundreds of people are able to say the, the conscious, the conscious, the Consciousness of the presence of God is today the most important fact of their lives. They present a powerful reason why they should have faith. So in step, when we get through this work in step 10, we're going to be talking about we've entered the world of the Spirit. And a little later in that chapter, in that step, it's going to talk about a real warning that when we rest on our laurels, we can exit the world of the Spirit as fast as we came in it. And this is why I go back through this work a lot, because... Am I living on an experience that I had last year or the year before, you know, uh, the work I went through five years ago or three years ago? Is that the experience I'm coming up to the podium and sharing today? It's easy. I, I can't. I rest on my laurels and I'm back. So as fast as I'm in the world of the Spirit, I'm out of the world of the Spirit. So, we, so now we come to what guys that go through the work and have been with me, page 52. Where are the laughs over here? Page 52. The bedevilments. Restless, irritable, and discontent. Drunk or sober. Not just when I'm drinking. When I stop drinking too. And this is the unmanageability in our lives. This is the stuff I can't fix on my own power. This is the stuff that I go to the outside and try and fix. With cars. With prestige. With power it talks about. Money. Women, whatever it is, I try and fix this stuff on the outside and realize I've got to come to believe that I can only fix the inside with the inside. I've got to get rid of this stuff. I'm not going to fix it with material things. And I can't do it on my own power. So it says we have to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems. This is the same readiness to change our point of view, the same thing with the powerless over alcohol, that I need a power greater than myself. And it says, you know, I change the weed eye. I'm having problems with personal relationships. I talked about that, not whether I'm in one or not in one, but how am I doing in them with the people around me? I couldn't control my emotional natures. Am I, you know, screaming at the person that pulled in the parking spot in front of me and just ruined my day? You know, is it making me crazy? Uh... Am I losing my temper? Am I kicking the door and punching walls? Not drunk. Completely removed of alcohol. Leaving this meeting, feeling all jacked up. I went to a meeting, I'm fixed, and then go home and my kid says something and I punch a hole through the wall. 
You know, how's that working? You know, you know, am I prey to misery and depression? And again, I'm talking about not the clinical depression that you go really, but the depression from this untreated alcoholism, you know, that couldn't make a living, you know, and a living being a life, you know, something that I'm proud to say doesn't mean whether I'm making money or not. Some of the richest people I know are the poorest people I ever met. It has nothing to do with making a living monetary monetarily. It's about making a living that I'm proud to say this is my life. Look in the mirror and look at the other guy. Look at the guy when I look in the mirror and am I okay with that guy? You know? Am I useless, full of fear, unhappy? Am I no help to other people? You know, are these the bedevilments? It says the basic solution, more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight. So what it's saying at this point is, you know, am I watching this happen around me or am I doing anything about it? I can't do it on my own. I need help. And I got to just keep getting this pounded into me that I'm unmanageable, I'm insane, and I'm powerless, and I've got to deal with it. Bless you. So we jump over to page 53. It says, logic is great stuff. We liked it. We still like it. It is not by chance we are given the power to reason, to examine the evidence of our senses, the senses being our step one experience, and to draw the conclusions in step two that I need. So my senses are telling me that I'm powerless, and my conclusion saying I need a power greater than myself. I need to be open-minded and willingness to, to have this. And then we come to the second part of step two. And I've got to hammer this home constantly. I've got to hammer home the powerlessness, and then I hammer this home. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis. So the crisis is self-imposed. Okay, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he's nothing. God either either is or he isn't. What is our choice to be? And this, I believe this is the last choice I'm going to make in this work. I make this choice. You know, the rest of the stuff, I'm going to make a decision in step three, and then I'm going to just launch into step four and five. But I've got to make a choice right now that, for me, my choice was God is everything. And I didn't understand this in the beginning, and I once heard someone share about it, and I was like, God, it's crazy, all this stuff. But I see it today in my life, and I see how a higher power is working in my life, and, you know, and how God works in my life. And... You know, if you look at it in a simple thing, if I'm powerless, I need power. And if I go to, and if God either is or he isn't, there's not like a partial. It's not like in, in how it works. There's, you know, half measures avail us nothing. They don't avail us half the solution here. And either God is everything or he's nothing. He's not three quarters. It either is or it isn't. A little bit further down, it, it says, arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. So we're going to talk about faith again. We couldn't duck the issue. And it says, some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason towards the desired shore of faith. The outline and the promises of the new land had brought luster into the tired eyes and the fresh courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands stretched out and welcome. And these rooms were my friendly hands. When I first came in, and I look, you know, like, I always say, like, who are the angels in your life? Like, who, who was there when you first came in? I had a guy in Summit, uh, Charlie, let him rest in peace right now, and he took me around long enough. I was like a broken bird with broken wings, and he took me around and put me into a nest long enough till I could flap the wings and fly on my own and find my own way. And without him, I'm not sure where I'd be. And... and he brought me to a meeting where I found a sponsor who brought me to another, and, and the whole thing worked. And there's people in this room right here that were my angels from the beginning that looked after me and guided me and just kept pushing me forward, questioning me, causing resentments, wondering if I was still sober. You know, it's laughing over there, John. Um, so we're going to both, we don't have a lot of time, and there's so much to cover in step two. But, you know, I had to find on page 54 that I worshipped a lot of stuff and I talked about the stuff that I, you know, I worship because I try and fix the inside with the outside. And the only way I knew how to fix the inside was with the outside. And, and early in recovery, I did it with service commitments. 
I didn't do the work. I had no business at the podium. And I'd go, and I had a lot of service commitments. I was making coffee. I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was going out on speaking commitments. I'd get all jacked up, and I'd be all on fire. And then the next day, I'd feel like misery and depression all over again. And I'd got to go out and speak again. That's all I knew. I was trying to fix myself with speaking and fix myself with making coffee and and it all became stuff in my third column the it became how I needed you to be to make me feel all right and you're going to learn that when Rose does step three next week you know I need you to do something in my life to make me all right and early in it was before I understood this work it was just service commitments after service commitments and a lot of people stay okay like that didn't work for me because I came to a sober bottom. I came to an emotional breakdown, and it was either put a shotgun in my mouth and blow my head off, and God pointed me in another way and put me in the line of a guy that knew how to take me through this book, and my whole life changed from that. So um, we're going to jump over to page 55 real quick, and it's at the top it says, yet we've seen another kind of flight, because they're talking about you know, the, the lunar flights and the Wright brothers and stuff. Um, a spiritual liberation from this world. People who rose above their problems. I saw that in, some, in my sponsor. He rose above his problems. I saw stuff that went on in his life. He shared his story with me, and I saw how he was acting, and he had what I wanted. And when you go further in, and when you read into uh, how it works, and you sit in the meeting, and it talks about, you know, if you want what we have, you're willing to go to any length. I wanted what he had. He had a spiritual awakening as a result of this work. He rose above his problems. He was rocketed into the fort. Okay? And we've seen a spiritual release. You know, and I say that to, you know, when I go into meditation, have I seen it in myself? And then we come to the, where do we find this? Actually, we're fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, child is the fundamental idea of God. It's been obscured by calamity, so it's been blocked by all our problems and stuff that went on. With one year, with five years, with 20 years, it can get reblocked again. <clears throat> by pomp, worship of other things, but in some form or other it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and a miraculous demonstration of the power in human lives are the facts as old as man himself. Excuse me. So... <clears throat> This book's telling me where I can find God. It's deep down inside of me, and it's where I find my higher power. I've got to come in. You know, when, when you go through this work, you're going to learn. We're going to go in to clean out. We're going to go in. It's an inside job. We're going to peel these onions away to get into the good. So we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. And in Bill's story, he talks about his new friend, God. You know, and... When, you, when I think of a friend, a friend, what I used to think of a friend was the person that sat next to me in the bar. Today, I think of a friend as someone who's there for me at all times, and that's, that's what a friend is. Sometimes we have to search fearlessly for that, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In this last analysis, so constantly analyzing, trying to figure it out, it's only there that he may be found. It was so with us. Do I believe that if I do the steps and I go through this work, I can clean out and find this deep without, deep within me? So I'm going to jump to the last um, page here, or actually one before, and it talks about this, you know, this guy who went through, he was an atheist, and says the barriers he'd built through the years were swept away. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love. You know, whatever you call your higher power, it doesn't matter. He'd stepped from bridge to shore. For the first time, he lived in a conscious companionship with his creator. So, and this is, this is why I always wondered why priests and rabbis came, come into this program. And, they, you know, they, they, they're with God all the time. And I asked one, and he said, you know, because I need a conscious contact. with. I have faith, but it's through the work in AA that I got the contact with God, and I need to give it away. And I can't give it away to somebody else by not coming in here. So this this rabbi told me that he does always along with, not instead of. So he does all his other practices along with AA, not instead of. And at the last page, 
it says circumstances made me willing to believe. So, and <clears throat> this whole par- this whole chapter, step two, it came to believe. Well, again, why would I come to believe? Circumstances make me willing to believe. And if I don't go back to my first step situation, hopeless, powerless, insane, and unmanageable, why would I ever want to believe? And then it jumps down and says that God restored us all to our right minds. And it says, to this man the revolution was sudden. Some of us grow into it more slowly, but he has come. He, God has come to all who have honestly sought him. When we drew near him, through doing the work, through the steps, through practicing the principles, when we get closer to God, earlier in this chapter I read that my job is to draw nearer, to get close to him. He disclosed himself to us. So, I come, the last thing I just want to say, and we're probably almost out of time, is when you, when you go through the, this book, this textbook, you know, sure most everyone's pretty much seen our big book we're going to get to page 60 and it's going to say that being convinced we were at step three so obviously prior to that we were in the first step and right before it it says that we're alcoholic and couldn't manage our own lives alcoholic being powerless over alcohol bodily meaning physically and mentally the obsession of the mind and the allergy and couldn't manage our own lives in this page 52 we read spiritual malady, that no human power could have relieved our alcoholism and that God could and would if he were sought. So I come to believe in a power greater than myself because I have nowhere else to go. And I'll just close with this, that it doesn't always happen when you first come in. It can happen later on. It can happen with a year, with five years, with ten years. I have people I've, I talk to that 15 years of abstinence from, from alcohol and they first really see their truth and come to it and go through the work and have a spiritual experience. You don't have to wait that long. You know, get with somebody, see your truth in the first step, whatever your first step problem is, whether you're an addict, alcoholic, a gambler, it doesn't matter. We're powerless over something and our lives are become unmanageable. And when we see that, it's easy to come through that door and go into the second step and get the hope, the sanity, the power. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.